My dear friends, hope all of you are keeping well by the grace of God. And we have been waiting and praying for this retreat. So we are on the first day of our Holy Eucharist retreat. So as we begin with, we shall make a small prayer and we shall join together with this prayer. Eternal Father, I offer, I offer you, you the body, body and blood, soul, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So offering up the precious body and blood, the soul and divinity of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ to the Heavenly Father for the atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. It's a beautiful prayer. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So on this first day, uh, as we enter into this retreat, I want all of you to pray to the Holy Spirit of God to open our hearts and minds to understand the Word of God that we are going to listen. So every moment, listen to the Holy Spirit of God so that the inner meaning of every word that we reflect become flesh in our hearts and in our lives. And our Blessed Mother, all the angels and saints, they are all around us praying for because we are reflecting upon the eternal mystery, the Holy Eucharist. So as we are on this first day, there are lots of people very often ask me questions, you know, especially people who find it very difficult to believe in the real presence of our Blessed Lord in the Holy Eucharist. There are lots of people ask, you know, why do we offer this holy uh, sacrifice every day? It is a superstitious practice. And what is it called? The Lord gives his flesh to eat and his blood to drink, eating flesh and drinking blood. Is it called cannibalism or barbarianism? Now, why do we do all these things? So there are a lots of questions that is happening around. So therefore, we are going to uh, answer some of those questions going through the Jewish background. When we go through the history, we will find the Jewish people, you know, they firmly believed in the first century. You know, I'm not talking about the modern century. I'm talking about first century after the institution of the Holy Eucharist, they really believed in the real presence of our blessed Lord in the Holy Eucharist. If they can believe, we can also believe. And how they believed, because they knew the Old Testament and they knew what is happening in the New Testament. As one of our, our great fathers said, now uh, New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament and Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. So when we find out this connection, the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we get a clear picture of, of the real presence of God in the Holy Eucharist. Therefore, we shall learn. So there are uh, three major areas where we can, you know, there are lots of uh, elements that you can think about. But I want you to know about three major areas of the Old Testament and New Testament connection, which proves that Jesus Christ instituted the Holy Eucharist with his own precious body and blood. So we shall go through that uh, today on this first day of our reflection. First of all, uh, the first area is Passover. Now, we are all in Exodus. In the Old Testament, there was an Exodus from the land of slavery to the promised land. And we are also in the same boat, you know, though we are here uh, with all the freedom and the redemption that the Lord has given, but still we are on an exodus. So we have a new Passover. So there is uh, a Passover in the Old Testament, which was a sign of exodus, which was a starting point of exodus. And in the New Testament, we have the new Passover instituted by our blessed Lord Jesus Christ in order that we are having uh, a new exodus to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the heaven which we are all awaiting for. So it is important to know what has happened in the Old Testament. So therefore, we shall read from the book of Exodus chapter 12. That I'll give you a small background. We know that people of Israel, they were all under the slavery of the Egyptians. And they were struggling so much where our blessed Lord wanted to rescue them. Now, how can we rescue them? 
there are lots of things our blessed lord uh, spoke through prophets and also through uh, different people but nothing was working there was only one solution the solution for all our problem is a sacrifice all throughout the scripture we will find the solution for all our problems very often people come and tell me father we prayed so many rosaries but nothing is happening we prayed so many stations of the cross but nothing works in our lives there are so many areas that we cried out to the lord but nothing working there is only one solution for the impossibilities of our lives and that is a sacrifice and understand the sacrifice understand the meaning of the sacrifice understand the effects of the sacrifice only then you will be able to understand the freedom given by this holy sacrifice the holy eucharist so therefore one of the instructions that the lord gave to moses was now you call the assembly of the people of god and i want you to do one thing that is each family has to choose a male lamb one year old male lamb without blemish we shall read from the book of exodus chapter 12 verse 5 book of exodus chapter 12 verse 5 your lamb shall be without blemish your lamb shall be without blemish then a year old male mm. you may take it from the sheep or from the goats mm. next sentence too you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month Yeah. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. So that's very important, you know, that you know the Lord said that's a month of Nisan and the Lord said you shall keep the lamb until the 14th day of the month of Nisan and then you have to slaughter. When you come to the New Testament you will find Jesus the last supper and then Jesus died on the uh, on the on the on the 14th day the exact day. of the month of nisan the lamb was slaughtered exactly on that day so therefore um uh, and also you have to gather together on the twilight you know the the word of god so that's in the evening so the night in the evening the night you have to gather together and you have to have a lamb without any blemish and you have to slaughter that lamb and thereafter you have to roast the lamb and you have to eat and you have to drink now this was a commandment given by our blessed lord to moses in order that you know the people of israel be rescued and the lord said on that day when you are having all this meal there will be a passover i will pass over and my 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 saints my my angels will pass over in order that you will be rescued and how will you be rescued you will have to take the blood no you have to eat the lamb the the roasted lamb and you have to take the blood and you have to sprinkle it on your doorsteps and the lintels of your house now we shall read again uh, the same chapter verse 22 how it was sprinkled take a bunch of hyssop mm-hmm. dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two door posts with the blood in the basin so now so moses is giving that instruction you have to take a branch of the hyssop a hyssop branch and then dip it in the in the blood and then you can sprinkle it on the door steps and the lintels of your house can you recall something similar in the life of our blessed lord when our lord jesus christ was there on the cross we will find in the gospel of saint john when jesus on words uh, sorry chapter 19 uh, words 29 we will find when he was there on the cross you know a hyssop branch was given we shall read that john chapter 19 verse 29 a jar full of sour wine was standing there yeah so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth next sentence too when jesus had received the wine he said it is finished and now when jesus received the wine now the wine was given you know on a hyssop branch that was the same branch used to sprinkle the precious blood uh, the blood of the lamb uh, to the doorpost and the lintels and the same branch is used you know to give the last cup of the liturgy of or the rite of the passover 
and that is when our Lord completed the sacrifice on the cross. So therefore, uh, we understand from the Old Testament now what are the areas of the Passover. Now a lamb without blemish and now 14th day of the month of Nisan and now it should be in the evening, in the evening of, uh, of, of the twilight of the day. And then again, it, there, there, there should be a priest. And now at that time, the priest was the, the head of the family, the father or the one who is the eldest in the family. He is the one who is supposed to uh, lead this liturgy, lead this ceremony. So a priest was also there. Now these are all uh, what is called the, the, the offering or the Passover meal in the Old Testament. And now let us come to the New Testament when Jesus Christ on the day of Passover. We, shall, uh, we, we will read that in a lot of places whenever the Holy Eucharist is mentioned, mentioned that's all on the feast of the Passover. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, it's a discourse about the, about the Holy Eucharist that happens on the day of the Passover. And now Last Supper. Now, on the night of the Last Supper. You can imagine the New Testament on the eve of the, of, the, of, the, of the day when the Nisan, the month of Nisan, 14th uh, uh, day. Now, evening, the eve of Last Supper, that night. Now, Jesus gathered all the disciples and 12 of them. And Jesus told them, prepare uh, the Passover uh, on that particular place. And now the Lord has shown everything. And now Jesus also came. And now there is a huge difference between the Passover in the Old Testament and the Passover in the New Testament. Now, which are those, those differences? Now, in the Old Testament, you will find a lamb. And there is no lamb here. In the New Testament, when Jesus, uh, on the evening of the Last Supper, on the night of the Last Supper, when Jesus gathered together, there is no lamb. And there is no priest. Now, two important elements of a sacrifice is missing here. And now, you may be wondering why this is it. Even the disciples were wondering why. Where is the lamb? This question has been there always. Where is the lamb for the sacrifice? When our blessed Lord came for the public ministry, people all asked, where is the lamb for sacrifice? That is when John the Baptist showed Jesus and said, here is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So now here is the lamb. So therefore, there are three differences or changes that, makes, that Jesus makes in the New Testament for the Passover meal, for the new Exodus. This is a new Passover. And the, the, the continuation and the fulfillment of the Old Testament Passover happens in Jesus Christ on the day of Last Supper. Now, why there is no priest? Now, we know very well, now Jesus Christ is the high priest. As we know very well, in the Old Testament, we will find after they were rescued from the slavery of the Egyptians. Now, what happens? Now, they started worshipping pagan gods. We know that famous story of worshipping golden calf. That is when our blessed Lord has taken away the priesthood from all of them. And then it was assigned to only one of the tribes out of the twelve. And those tribes were called Levites. Only the Levites were allowed to do the priestly ministry. Now the rest of all, all of them were taken away because of their disobedience. But now, coming to the New Testament, our blessed Lord, uh, on, the, on the evening of Last Supper, on that night, our blessed Lord conveyed this eternal message to the entire world. And Jewish people got it right at that time that there is no more uh, priest, but now Jesus Christ is the priest. And then Jesus said, I'm going to do this because I am the priest. And now where is the lamb? Jesus himself became the lamb. I am the lamb who is going to be slaughtered. Therefore, take this uh, blood and take this bread and now eat. This is my body. This is my flesh. Therefore, take and eat. So therefore, let this be a, a, a beautiful moment you know, where our blessed Lord instituted the priesthood. And now how? Now there are 12 apostles and after instituting the Holy Eucharist, our blessed Lord said, do this in memory of me. That means wherever you go, you do the same on behalf of me. 
So our blessed Lord handed over the priesthood to 12 apostles, which is the continuation which we enjoy and experience even today. So therefore, do this in memory of me. You know, so the Lord himself has told them and they are doing it even today. So therefore, only a priest can offer the sacrifice. And the lamb is our blessed Lord himself. And now there is something different happening here, a third area, and that is a new sacrifice. It is not the, the, the flesh of the lamb, but rather it is bread and wine. Now, if you come across that, the bread and wine. Why this bread and wine? Where does it come from? We shall read when we go back to the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 14, verse 18 to 20, we shall read. Book of Genesis, chapter 14, verse 18. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. Now, Melchizedek, you know, the high priest in the Old Testament, book of Genesis, and now he is coming from uh, uh, Salem. Salem is Jerusalem. You know, that's a short form, Jerusalem. So now the high priest coming from Jerusalem, and now he is bringing bread and wine. And who is meeting with? With Abraham. Next sentence. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth. Next sentence too. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him one-tenth of everything. Now, this is a small passage, but think about, you know, you go to a temple, you offer one-tenth of your, your I mean, the tithe that you offer, and now you participate in the bread and wine, and now the priest is blessing you. That's exactly what is happening with us when we go through the Holy Eucharist. Now we bring our offerings, we bring and we give, and then we give the offertory, and then we participate in the meal, uh, the, the bread the, and the wine, the precious body and blood, and then the priest blesses you and you go back. Now, as we read in the letter to the Hebrews, you know, as in the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, the high priest. Now, our blessed Lord Jesus Christ became the high priest. Now, he is the one who is the one who he is the one who will be offering, and he is the offertory. He is the victim, and he is the one who offers. Now, this becomes together in our blessed Lord Jesus Christ the next day when he goes to the Mount of Calvary. Now, on Good Friday, when he sacrifices his own precious body and his own precious blood, now this becomes the reality. Now, how beautiful it is to see the Passover in the Old Testament and the new Passover and the new Exodus, which is taking us towards eternal Jerusalem. So therefore, our blessed Lord, with all the uh, distinguishive, uh, distinctive elements, that means the new uh, bread and wine, as well as there's no priest, Jesus becomes the priest and he is the lamb. And now, now everything is, is in a new order. So therefore, Holy Eucharist is the new Passover for you and for me and all those who believe. And now it's a foretaste of the eternal uh, heavenly Jerusalem. So that is the first area. Now we shall enter into the second element. Now the second element, you know, one is uh, very familiar with the Jewish community was the idea of, uh, of manna. Now where does it come from? Now after crossing the Red Sea, People of Israel, you know, they were continuing their journey after having been rescued them, after having been blessed them so much. One of the things that they do in their life is complaining. You now, sometimes in our lives too, we, we sometimes complain again and again, uh, even after God has blessed us. So their complaining was this, now we don't have anything to eat. Now, it is better to go back to, to, to Egypt and now it doesn't matter whatever we go through, at least we get something to eat. You know, our, our discipleship, the journey with the Lord is not easy. It's a very hard journey. Therefore, very often we all go back, go back to our past areas, go back to our past sinful areas, but that's not the way. If you really believe in the Holy Eucharist and if you really, really believe in the sacrifice of our blessed Lord, need to continue with with the all the hard areas 
But now what is happening now? The blessed Lord has seen their, their complaining and their cry. Therefore, blessed Lord told through Moses, I'll do one thing. I'll give you two things. What is that? One is in the morning, I'll give you manna. And in the evening, I'll give you meat to eat. That is quails. Now we shall read from uh, the book of Exodus chapter 16, verse 12. Book of Exodus chapter 16, verse 12. I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So now it's so clear where the Lord himself is telling, I'll give you uh, bread in the morning to eat, and in the evening there will be meat to eat, that is quails I'll be giving to you. And now what is this manna all about? Now this manna is a special food. They never saw uh, this food and they never heard about it. It was so special to the people of Israel. Now how does it look like? We shall read the same chapter verse 31 where uh, there is a description about manna. The house of Israel called it manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Now, wafers made with honey and manna looks like white. Now, it's a white bread and now it tastes like honey. Now, what is that meaning of that honey there? Now, our blessed Lord told them, I'm going to lead you to the land which is full of milk and honey. Now, this manna, a bread that came down from heaven, is the foretaste of Canaan, the promised land. And now when you come to the New Testament, you will, when you receive the Holy Eucharist, the white bread, it is also a foretaste of, of the eternal Jerusalem that is awaiting for us. So there is a deep meaning within it that the Jewish people, they, they really knew what it was. And now what happened with the manna? Now they ate this manna daily. Now you can imagine 40 years of their journey, our blessed Lord provided manna fresh every day. Now can you imagine a, a small prayer that Jesus has taught you and me? What is that? Our Father. And in that prayer, give us our bread daily. Now why that word daily? You know, if you go through the, uh, the, the real original translation uh, from Greek, it is called, uh, it is called epiousia. That means... There's only, this word is used only for that, only one time in the Bible and only for that, that, that is called daily. Now what is that daily? St. Jerome translates it, it is the super substantial. Daily is the super substantial bread. So it is not about a bread, simple bread that our blessed Lord Jesus is talking about. Our Lord Jesus talking, Jesus said, you pray that, give us, the, give us this day out daily bread so give us this day each day bread you know we could have said like that but this daily that is something very specially used now therefore catechism of the catholic church i shall read that for you uh, 2837 catholic catechism of the catholic church paragraph 2837 it says epi use it's only one place that it is there and it refers directly to the bread of life, the body of Christ, the medicine of immortality without which we have uh, no life within us. So it's so beautiful. Now this manna they received daily. Now therefore the catechism of the Catholic Church says for this reason it is fitting that the Eucharistic liturgy be celebrated each day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So therefore, why do we have this liturgy every day? Why? You know, there are lots of people go every day for Holy Mass. Why? They all know the meaning. They all know the liturgy and the and the and the scriptural background and why the Blessed Lord want, want this to happen. So daily. So it is fitting to celebrate this liturgy every day without fail. So therefore, 40 days. Uh, 40 years without fail, daily our blessed Lord gave this bread. And again, it is interesting um, to reflect upon. Now, after they have finished, you know, this journey completed, 
Now, as they are finishing their journey, now Moses told them something. What is that? You should keep this manna in a golden pot. You should keep this manna in a golden pot. And you should keep it. And now you shall keep it, not just you keep it, but you should always remember for generations and generations that the Lord was with us. Now think about that beautiful area, golden, you know, in a golden pot, manna. Can you recall something? When you go to your own parish, you, you find there is, there is a golden pot where the real presence of our blessed Lord. It's a tabernacle which is everywhere. In all the churches, we have the, the tabernacle. So therefore, uh, manna is the, is, the, is the real presence of our blessed Lord. Now, let us come to the New Testament. Now, what does our blessed Lord speak about it? We shall read. This is something so beautiful. We shall go and read from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, verse 49 onwards. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. Now, our blessed Lord clearly says, your ancestors ate the manna, which is a prefiguration of the Holy Eucharist. Now, the white bread, which is the foretaste of the, uh, of the, of the promised land. Now, they ate and they died then. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, mm. so that one may eat of it and not die. Okay. Continue. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Jesus said, Now I am the living bread. Now your ancestors ate manna, they are dead. But now I am the living bread. Came down from heaven. A manna from heaven for you and for me to be satisfied, to be rescued, to be delivered. Then continue. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Oh, that is something very serious. Now, the bread that I give you is my own flesh. Now, this was a very dangerous teaching at that time. Our blessed Lord gave to the, uh, to the people as well as to the, to the disciples. Now, so far it's all okay. Now, they have ate the bread from uh, heaven, the manna, they died. But now I am the living bread. I am the bread that came down from heaven. So far it's okay. And our blessed Lord said, the bread that I'm going to give you is my own flesh. And now they got, there is a there is lot of things happening around. They're all murmuring. They're all asking, how can this be happening? Now this is called a barbarianism, it's cannibalism. Think about all those areas now. No, this man is telling that he is going to give his flesh to eat. Now, how can they grasp? Many left. Even today, many people leave the Holy Eucharist because it's not that easy to understand. We shall continue reading. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then. So Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you. Now, Jesus said to them, now think about, Jesus did not say, oh, don't worry, it was a symbolic presentation I was using. Jesus did not care. Jesus said, even if you go, even if you under, do not understand this, I'm not going to change my stand. This is for what I have come into this world. Therefore, our blessed Lord says, very truly, I tell you. Then. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So now Jesus has gone one more step. It's not only eating of the flesh, but it is drinking of the blood, which was forbidden for the Jewish community. The Jewish people, they never ever wanted to drink the blood. So therefore, now many of them got offended. Now Jesus did not change his stand. Jesus said, now the flesh that I give is my own flesh. The bread that I give is my own flesh. And unless you eat my flesh, and drink my blood, you will not have life in you. Next sentence too. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, yeah. and I will raise them up on the last day. And I will raise them on the last day. Now it just become a big commotion there. Nobody can understand at that time what it is. And uh, now only the disciples left. 
and the disciples are also confused now what is he telling about now verse 60 on verse we shall read chapter 6 verse 60 when many of his disciples heard it they said this teaching is difficult who can accept it so they said this is so difficult who can accept eating flesh and drinking blood who can accept all these things now jesus is not going to change but what did jesus say but jesus being aware that his disciples were complaining about it said to them does this offend you so jesus is asking does this offend you then then what if you were to see the son of man ascending to where he was before so now how blessed lord is telling now you got offended about this but what about if you really see what the ascension of our blessed Lord, the resurrection of our blessed Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ is telling them, this is nothing compared to what I wanted to share with you. I wanted to, 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 to explain to you. That means now you are seeing the, the precious body and blood that is broken on the Mount of Calvary. But what if, if you see the resurrected body and the blood of Jesus? Now we participate, we as Catholics, we participate in the precious body and blood of Jesus Christ and also the resurrected body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's our, uh, that's our participation, how fortunate we are. That's why we have a direct connection towards heaven, uh, the foretaste of the new Jerusalem, which is already within us. So how beautifully our blessed Lord is explaining. Now, this is nothing that I'm teaching to you, but this is the reality. Now, how beautiful it is to, to believe in the precious body and blood and to participate in the communion, the, the, the reception of the Holy Communion and the precious body and blood of Jesus Christ and participate in the resurrected body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that gives us complete deliverance. So that's all about manna. So this manna, which, which became the real uh, flesh and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the new bread from heaven, that is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And now I'm going to take you to the third uh, area of the Jewish uh, concept. Now, the first one is the Passover. The second one is the manna. And now the third one, if you uh, heard it or not, I don't know, it's called bread of the presence. I don't know whether you heard about that. There are There is one time our Lord Jesus Christ himself is using that word, the bread of the presence. Now I can explain it in this way. You know, in our previous retreats, I have uh, told you about the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the tabernacle. Our blessed Lord said, you create a tabernacle. Tabernacle was the temple. The temple was the mobile temple for them. Wherever they went, the tabernacle was at the center of their travel. And they worshipped, they adored our blessed Lord. And now there should be three things in the tabernacle, in the temple. You know, what, which are the three things? The first one is the Ark of the Covenant. And now we know what is in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments and the Aaron's rod, which was proud to prove the right priesthood and also the pot of manna. And now the Ark of the Covenant uh, is the one thing. And how is that? That's a... Uh, uh, there is a mercy seat and uh, above the mercy seat there is going to be two giant statues of uh, cherubim. And I'll think about many people say, why do Catholics have statues? Now the first church that God designed, the first mobile temple that God designed had got statues. The Lord designed that the statues of, uh, of, uh, of two giant cherubim that is uh, uh, protecting the mercy seat. So therefore, there's nothing wrong having statues in our own, uh, our own churches. The, the, the word of God clearly teaches us that. So therefore, the Ark of the Covenant. And now there is a second area which is called lampstand, you know, which is called seven lampstands, which is made of gold. And the Lord said, you know, in front of the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, there should be lampstand with seven uh, lambs. And this is called seven tongues of fire. And now, what is the symbolism of seven tongues of fire? That's a symbolic presentation of the Holy Spirit of God. And now there is a third area uh, of, the, 
of the tabernacle which is called the table of the bread of presence. Now, what does it contain? The table of the bread of presence contain 12 pots of, of manna. So that means 12, that is describing the 12 tribes and now this 12 pot of manna which is there. And now you can imagine now this pot of manna which is a symbolic presentation of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, the table of the bread of presence is the, is the, is the modern uh, or uh, in the New Testament the, 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 the altar of the Lord. Now you can imagine if you really see what is in the tabernacle. Now, Heavenly Father seated in the mercy seat with all the cherubim, uh, cherubim around. And then there is Holy Spirit, the lampstand, seven tongues of fire and the table, our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father, Son and Holy Spirit together. The whole Trinity is present in the tabernacle. How wonderful is it to reflect upon. Now, among all these things, now one of the uh, teachings that our blessed Lord gave to the people of Israel was... When uh, this bread of presence, you know, they, they have to, they can eat the bread, but they have to replace the bread. And every time whenever they're the, 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 at the table of the bread of presence, where, whenever there is bread, the lamb always should be lit. Now you can see, if you look at our tabernacle here, there is our blessed Lord here and close to it, there is a lamp always uh, lighted in your parish wherever how do you know there is really a Jesus present in the tabernacle you will see the lamb because the lamb is lighting so therefore Holy Spirit and Son Jesus Christ they are inseparable so wherever our Lord Jesus Christ there is the presence of the Holy Spirit of God so therefore now this beautiful presentation of the bread of the presence you know that is what when we come to the new testament also we experience now i just wanted to explain this to you little more beautifully so that you will understand it more first samuel chapter 21 verse 3 onwards we shall read first samuel uh, chapter 21 verse 3 now then what have you at hand? So now this is the, the background is uh, King David is coming to the priest. Now King David is an expedition. They are going for a military expedition. And now he is so hungry to the extent he came to the priest and asked the priest, now have you got something to eat now? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. So give me five loaves of bread or whatever you have. I'm hungry then. Next. The priest answered David, I have no ordinary bread at hand, only holy bread, provided that the young men have kept themselves from women. So now, what a powerful message that our blessed Lord had given already. Now, what is this priest telling? Priest says, I have no ordinary bread, but I have super substantial bread, you know, which we are talking about. The, the extraordinary bread. We don't have any ordinary bread, but we have, uh, uh, we have holy bread provided that the young men have kept themselves from women. Now, who can handle this? Now, here comes the idea of celibacy for all the priests. A priest who is handling the bread of our blessed Lord now should not have anything to do with women. They have to be away from women. The sexual intercourse is, is exactly that is mean meant. And now the priest is telling very clearly, now this is only for a priest to handle. A person who is free or away from women can handle. So there are lots of dispute about the celibacy of the priest and every, you know, it's, it's clearly written in the Bible. And now what, what was the reply of uh, David? Next sentence. So the priest gave him the holy... David answered the priest... Indeed, women have been kept from us, as always, when I go on an expedition. So now David is confirming that we are in an expedition, so we don't have anything to do with women. So now we are worthy to receive the bread. Now continue. The vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is a common journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So now they said they have proof that they are holy. They are holy enough to receive this bread, holy bread. Next sentence. So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there 
except the bread of the presence. So there was no bread there except the bread of the presence. Then, which is removed from before the Lord, to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. So how beautiful it is! You can remove the bread, but the same day that bread is being replaced by the priest. Think about our bread of the presence, our tabernacle. Every day there is a consecration of the Holy Eucharist, and it is being replaced every day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, where does our blessed Lord speak about this bread of presence? You no, know, it's something so beautiful, amazing. You now, when we go on, we'll be going on so and so. Um, so we shall read. I'll conclude with this uh, session. We shall read from the Gospel of Saint Matthew, chapter twelve, verse one onwards. Matthew chapter twelve, verse one. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. So now it's very important. They have plucked grains, you know, the grains of the bread, and now they are eating. Now next. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him. Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. So your disciples on the Sabbath day, they're not supposed to pluck the grain. It's a job. So you're violating Sabbath and you should not be eating like that. And now what was the reply of our Lord Jesus? He said to them, have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? Which we read just before. Okay, continue. He entered the house of God. And ate the bread of the presence. And he ate the bread of the presence then, which it was not lawful for him or his companions to eat, mm. but only for the priests. Yeah. Then continue. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are guiltless? Now see, this is something our blessed Lord seriously says. Our blessed Lord says, "What is happening in the in the in the Old Testament?" Haven't you heard about that? The priest offers, you know, when there is not enough bread of presence, the priest offers the sacrifice and replaces the bread. And now, haven't you noticed that the priest is violating the Sabbath? Still, he is guiltless. He is not guilty of it. Our blessed Lord is telling to the entire crowd, "Now, here are my disciples. What are they doing? They are going to offer sacrifice on Sabbath day." And now they will not be guilty for that because that's going to happen. And even today, every Sunday, the priests are offering sacrifice. And now everyone comes and participate in that sacrifice. Therefore, you know what they are doing is right. Now the disciples later on, we know that they all offered sacrifices. Therefore, how important it is the bread of presence became the real bread that is Jesus' body and blood. So I wanted to conclude uh, this session with a small prayer in our hearts. Now think about our Lord Jesus Christ offered the Holy Eucharist on the night of the Last Supper. That was a symbolic presentation, you know, fulfillment of the Old Testament Passover, beginning of a New Testament, new Passover, and then literally in reality, Jesus offered it on the Mount of Calvary, breaking His own body and and shedding His own blood. And now, sacramentally, on every altar, it is being uh, uh, offered. You know, the uh, our Lord Jesus Christ offered this sacrifice. Uh, to the heavenly Father, and at any time it can be represented anywhere, any part of the world, any altars of the world. And how beautiful it is to participate in the Holy Mass daily in our lives. Therefore, we shall have a small prayer. Oh Lord, thank you for leading us into a new Passover and thereby to have a new Exodus in our life. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this new manna, which is the foretaste of our heavenly journey. Thank you, Lord, for this new bread of the presence, which is you yourself. You are the real presence with us, and thereby we enjoy the Holy Eucharist every day in our lives. So let that be our prayer. 
and thanking the Lord and understanding the value of and the greatness of this sacrifice. We shall continue the another um, other other two days as well and to, to know more and more about this Holy Eucharist and enjoy the beauty of participating in the Holy Eucharist. May the good Lord continue to bless each and every one of you. Continue to bless each and every one of you.